Good morning. It's been a, it's been a great morning already. Uh, I, I've been anticipating being with you for three years now. Uh, Ken Shoemate, really, Ken Shoemate had invited me for last year's uh, workshop, but he had invited me two years in advance of that workshop. And, and uh, this might surprise you, I'm not the kind of preacher that you have to invite two years in advance. I'm not, uh, my schedule's not that full. But uh, I had been looking forward to it, anticipating it. Well, when that workshop was canceled, uh, Ken explained to me, he said, we're going to have a new committee and a new theme, and I'll pass your information along, but that'll be up to them. And so uh, I'd kind of put it out of my mind, but was really delighted when, when uh, our brother contacted me and, and uh, Mike Huddleston contacted me and invited me to be at this year's workshop. And so I kind of got a second chance and, and uh, so very glad. I truly been, I, I know it's the polite thing to say that you're happy to be invited somewhere, but I really mean it. I, I have a a uh, big spot in my heart for the sojourners, and that is largely because my grandparents, as was mentioned in the bio, my grandparents were sojourners. And so I'm going to show you their picture here, if we get it up on there, I know it takes a second there, uh, Bud and Virginia Kilmer, they, they were sojourners from 1984 approximately to, and you might have a historian in the room, right? there, do you have a historian that's got... You know, somebody might have a whole list of the roster of everyone who's ever served and the dates, and so I might not have these dates exactly right, but my mom and my aunt helped me to kind of piece this together when uh, Grandma and Grandpa were involved in, in sojourners. Uh, Grandpa had a heart attack. He was, they were going to start traveling earlier in 1988, 82, but he had a heart attack in 82 about the same time he retired. took a couple years to, re, uh, to recover from that, and then they started traveling full-time with, with sojourners. If you go on, and I went on Sojourner's History page, and of course Paul and Peggy Scott started Sojourner's Ministry. If you look at your history page, the first couple to travel with them, their names were Richard and Georgie Jones. And Georgie Jones and my grandmother, Virginia Kilmer, were sisters. And so my grandparents were not charter members, but they were very, very close to that. And I think maybe even took a few trips before they were official members. Uh, that might not be allowed anymore, but I think back in the day they, they maybe did that. And so uh, I remember one time they came to Cedar Hill, Texas. My dad was preaching in Cedar Hill, Texas. They stayed there for about a month, I think. And, and uh, I was kind of an honorary soul. I was only in fifth grade, fifth, sixth grade. And I was an honorary sojourner during that month. And I, I took my friends. I didn't just show my friends my grandparents' RV. I took them in everybody's RV and uh, wanted to show them around. And I participated in everything. My grandma taught a calligraphy class for some of our church members, and I participated in that. I went out on the door knocking uh, efforts, and just about anything they did, I did uh, during that time. And just always really, really admired the, the ministry. Um, i get show you another picture here. Uh, this is... They were in Westlaco, Texas, before base moved here to Marshall, Texas. So I remember I even went to Westlaco to visit Grandma and Grandpa, and uh, not for the workshop. They were snowbirds. They would spend the whole winter in Westlaco. But I spent some time with them, and this is them, some of the group in a diner. That's my grandparents down at the bottom uh, left or right-hand corner there. Um, here's one of their trips. They were in Binger, Oklahoma. Not, not sure what all they were involved in there. That's my grandpa there on the, the, uh, down in the corner right there getting his haircut, that some of the uh, men, they needed haircuts, and they were just too busy, their schedule was too full, and so one of the ladies from the congregation uh, came to where they were camped out and gave them all haircuts, and so, uh, so that was part of that story, part of that mission there. Um, I don't know if their RV, their rig is pictured in that picture or not, I remember being a little bit smaller than the ones that, that are pictured, um, but again, lots of, of good memories. After my grandparents, or my grandpa passed away in 2010, and uh, he was 91, 92 years old. And uh, we went through the house and were able to keep some keepsakes and things that had sentimental value. And uh, what, what I gravitated towards was I wanted their uh, name tags. And so I've got them. In fact, I've here on my notebook, brought them with me. So I've got Grandma and Grandpa's soldier name tags. So I still thank you. I've kept those, and, and I understand that was an important part of uh, when they went, Grandpa and some of the men would go for coffee, the various places they went on sojourns, and they would always wear those name tags. And some Bible studies came as a result of just the conversations that were started uh, from them wearing their, their, their name tags. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for, Father, for this group 
uh, Father, for a, a group of, of individuals who are retired but not retired from your service. And Father, I just uh, pray a prayer of blessing over every assignment that they have signed up for this past week. Father, for all the sojourns that will take place uh, in this coming year. Father, I pray blessings and success for for this group and for the congregations and the Christians and the communities that they will bless. Father, be with us as we go through this uh, workshop this week. Uh, Father, in our sessions together, Father, I just pray for a a ready recollection of those things that have been prepared as uh, we look at these ancient words that continue to, to bless us so many centuries later. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, my family asked me what I was going to be preaching about at the workshop, and I said, the Bible. And they said, you always do that. And I said, well, you don't understand. It's not just from the Bible. We're talking about the Bible at this workshop. I actually brought two, you know you're in trouble when a preacher brings two Bibles into the pulpit with him. So I brought two Bibles this morning. This is what a Bible is supposed to look like. Amen? Amen. So, so black cover, uh, you It's faded, it's very old, Uh, you can't see, but stamped across the front are the words Holy Bible. Uh, My Bible that I usually preach out doesn't have that, it says Holy Bible on the front. This is the King James Version, 1611. Uh, A lot of you probably grew up, uh, maybe still use the King James. Some of the first memory work that some of us did was out of the King James Version, and so we remember the the beautiful poetic language uh, that is a part of of this uh, translation. Uh, This is, uh, again, it's a black cover, it's not navy blue, it's not burgundy, it's not forest green, it's certainly not one of the neon colors that sometimes you you see some of the kids uh, carry. Uh, This is free of of any cross-references or study notes, it's just a pure, unaltered word of God. Now, this copy is special to me because this one belonged to my grandma Kilburn. In fact, this was given to her on Christmas Day, 1938. And so it says on the inside, it was presented to Virginia Andrews, her maiden name, I was given to her by her parents, and so here's a Bible that's over 80 years old. She was 14 when she received it. Uh, I don't know if she, maybe she still traveled with it when she was in Sojourners, I, I don't know, uh, but uh, it, was, it was passed down to me. But even as I tell you that, um, I also tell you this, this also is a Bible, or at least it contains a Bible, and so uh, I could open up my phone and I could access 40 different versions of Scripture. And I could click and I could scroll. And it's kind of, it's kind of funny the terminology we use because even with a piece of modern technology, we still call it scrolling, scrolling, right? And so I could scroll through and, I, and Gutenberg, Gutenberg the, uh, the visionary that gave us the printing press, couldn't have even imagined that one day people would have such easy access to Scripture and, and be able to, to access it so easily and so Readily, But I, I still think there's something to be said for Bibles that look like Bibles are supposed to look like. And, and you even see a lot of times on church signs and marquees, they, they will have a picture of a Bible. So, uh, usually it's a Bible that looks like this. And so they've got a picture of a Bible. Sometimes it's a picture of an open Bible. And you see it presented that way. And so the message that's being communicated when you see that is, this is our source of authority. And this is what we stand upon. This is, this is where our information comes from. This is how we shape our worldview. This is what is really important to us, a symbol of authority. And there's a lot of people that don't understand that. And so they would ask us, are you really basing your entire worldview on, and your beliefs on a book that is antiquated, out of date, hard to understand, not very in touch with everyday life. And we would answer that, well, yes, yes, we are. Because we do believe that this comes from God. And we acknowledge that sometimes it's hard to understand, but we don't agree with all your characterizations of it because we do believe that it still has a word to speak to us today. And sometimes it's a little difficult. Sometimes we have to, to work a little bit to get to that message, but we believe it's worth the effort because we believe this is God's revelation to us. And, and really, there are three categories of, of people. Uh, There are those people that would say of the Bible that it's just another book. And so if you want to read the Bible, that's fine, but there are probably other things that you could spend your time reading. You could read history, you could read uh, fiction, you could read poetry. There's other good uh, literature out there, and so the Bible is just, just a book, just another book. And then there's a second category of people, and they would say, 
this is an important book. And so these are the folks that would say, acknowledge, and there's a lot of good wisdom and, and information, moral teachings in the Bible. And they might concede, historically speaking, the Bible is, is pretty important because it has spawned movements and it started revivals. And, and anecdotally, the Bible has, has changed people's lives. And uh, it's very useful for understanding one of the world's major religions. And so they would say, well, the, the Bible, they would kind of put it on equal standing with something like the Quran, and they would say, well, the Quran teaches us about the religion of Islam, and the Bible teaches us about the religion of Christianity, and so they're both important books, and they kind of put them there on the same, on the same level. But then there's a third category, and this is the category I think, I think we're in, I'm in, I think you're in, and that is that we believe that this is the book, the book. And so... For those of us in, in this category, the Bible shapes our worldview. Uh, we don't just read it, we feed on it. Uh, the great British novelist Walter Scott was on his deathbed. And he said to his secretary, he said, bring me the book. And she just shook her head because she knew he had a library of thousands of books. And so she asked for clarification. She said, what, what book are you, you've got thousands of volumes in your library. What, what are you talking about? He said, he said, bring me the book, the Bible, the only book for a dying man. But you and I know it's not just a book for a dying man, it's a book for a living man and woman. Because this is the book that, that teaches us, that shows us how to, to navigate our lives. George Mueller, who founded uh, an orphanage in England years ago, said, said this. He was a great missionary. He said, the vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. The first three years after my conversion, I neglected the word of God. Since I began to search it diligently, the blessing has been wonderful. Great has been the blessing from consecutive, diligent, daily study. I look upon it as a lost day when I have not had a good time over the word of God. Uh, that encourages, that inspires me. I want to be more like that. Uh, I want to get to that point where if I go a couple days without reading the Bible, I really feel like I'm missing something, that I've missed something. If, if we went a couple days without a meal, we would feel it, wouldn't we? And we want to get to that point where if we went a couple days without reading the Bible, it just, we wouldn't feel right. We would feel neglected. We would feel malnourished. And so Jesus said, said this. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes, oh, sorry, went too far. On every word that comes from the mouth of God. So our main text this morning is, is 2 Timothy chapter 3. Starting in verse 14, but we're going to begin at the beginning of this chapter to kind of set the, the stage and the context. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, now let's start in, in verse 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women. They're loaded down with sins and swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected, but they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will become clear to everyone. And so Paul takes Timothy and us on a tour of the moral sewer. Now, you didn't think you came to Camp B to tour a sewer, but, but here we are. So in two verses, just two verses, Paul lists about 20, almost 20 sins. So it's just bam, bam, bam. Here are all these sins and all these terrible things that, that mankind is involved in. And, and then he gives us a description in verses 6 through 9 of false teachers. Let me say something about false teachers. Uh, I think sometimes we perhaps use that term uh, too often. Uh, we use the label false teacher for, to label anyone who has a view that's different than, than ours. Uh, I could identify easily a false teacher. Anybody that disagrees with me obviously is a, is a false teacher. But a couple things. James chapter 3 verse 2 says anyone who is never at fault 
in what they say is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know any perfect people. There's not any perfect preachers, okay? I'm, I'm certainly not one. Those of us that preach, uh, and I've met several of you who are preachers, we make mistakes, don't we? we? We say things and we would want to take back or things that we say differently now than what we, how we presented them uh, perhaps years ago. There's no perfect preachers. No perfect elders. I know some of you are, are shepherds, elders in your congregations. No perfect elders. I've got, I've got wonderful elders. I, I love the elders that I'm blessed to work with at Robinson Avenue. They would be the first to tell you they're not perfect. No perfect sojourners. Great people here at this camp. No, none of you would, would claim to, to be perfect. And so uh, let's be careful about throwing out labels every time we disagree with someone. False teacher, false teacher, false teacher. But on the other hand, false teachers do exist. They exist in the first century, they they still do today. Now, when the Bible talks about false teachers, it's not just the content of their teaching, it's the character of their lives. And and that's that's very interesting to me, that when we have these particular descriptions, almost every passage you read about a false teacher identifies some character deficiencies and moral shortcomings. And so here, in verse 6 and following, these false teachers, what do they do? They manipulate the vulnerable. They have lots of obvious sins in their own life. The text says they're loaded down with sins. Uh, They're very proud. These these aren't the people that you want to to follow, but yet they attract this following. And and Paul gives this example of of Jonas and Jambres opposing Moses. Now, uh, you you can look in your index and your concordance. You're not going to find those names anywhere in the Old Testament. Okay, So, So who were these men that opposed Moses? Well, there are extra biblical sources, that is sources outside the Bible, that suggests that that these men were some of the Egyptian sorcerers who opposed Moses before Pharaoh. And that's what corrupt teachers will do. They will stand in the way of God's will and God's truth. And so how is Timothy then, who's a young man who Paul has placed in Ephesus with a very specific, very important mission, how is it that that Timothy, as a young man, is going to lead people out of this moral sewer? Well, one thing that he needs to do is he needs to follow Paul's example as a, as a mentor. And we're not going to read; we're skipping some verses here, but verses ten and following talk about the example that, that Paul had set for Timothy. But the second thing that he needs to do is that he needs to remember the instruction he had received through the Holy Scriptures. And so, let's read our main text, and then we'll spend the rest of our time this morning discussing it. So now 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, picking up in verse 14. Uh, 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. 2 Timothy 3, 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. I think that's interesting. I was talking to Mike uh, last night about uh, he and Nadine working with starting cradle roll ministries, and, and sometimes people question, well, can kids really learn at that young of an age? Notice what it says about Timothy, how from infancy you've learned the Holy Scriptures. So it's important. Shout out to all the cradle roll teachers, okay? It's important to, to, to teach our kids. And so he says, from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So so let's talk about this. The first thing we see is we see a designation of Scripture, designation of Scripture, and the designation of the words of God, and that is that it's Scripture. That's what it says in verse 15, it says the Holy Scriptures, it says in 16, mentions again the word Scripture. The, The Greek word there is graphe. That's the word from which we get the word graph. Now, uh, you don't have to know Greek to go to heaven, okay? You won't understand anybody when you get there, but you don't have to know Greek to, to go to heaven. That was a joke, by the way. So, <laughs> But the, the word here is, is graphe, and, and it simply means writing. So this is the word from which we get telegraph, autograph, polygraph. Graph means writing. And so this is important because it tells us that, that God didn't just think his message. Uh, God didn't just speak his message. God didn't just reveal his message through dreams and visions, but he ensured that this message was, was written down. Now, God didn't have to do this. He, he didn't have to reveal himself in this way, but there's good, there are good reasons why he did. 
First of all, a, a written message can be accurately preserved for future generations. Uh, we, we know that it was for Timothy. Uh, two chapters earlier, in chapter 1, verse 5, Paul said, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded lives now in you also. And so Timothy was taught by his mother and by his grandmother. What did they teach him? What was the curriculum? What was their textbook? It was the scriptures. Now for them, that was the Old Testament. That was the Hebrew Bible. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit here in a few moments. So they taught him that the scriptures, a written message could be accurately preserved for future generations. A written message can be examined repeatedly. So if God had just given us a long speech that had not been written down or recorded, and we were all able to hear it just one time, that would be beneficial. There would be some things that, that we uh, could learn from that. that. That would be good. But there would be a lot of content that we might want to go back and, and re-examine. Uh, as soon as I finish this message today, you're going to forget some of what I have shared. I'm going to forget. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to produ uh, reproduce this message without my notes here in front of me. Uh, now, you could go back. This is being recorded. You could go back and watch the recording, or you could read my manuscript. Uh, but again, that just points to the importance of, of having something actually recorded because we want to return to it. We want to study it. We want to examine it, re-examine it. That's, and we could do that with scriptures because it's been written down for us. It's been written down for us. A, a written message can be translated accurately into other languages. And so where I preach at, at Robinson Avenue, uh, we actually have worship services in three different languages on Sundays on our campus. And so we've got Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters uh, that meet on a built, separate building, but it's on our, on our lot. And then we have some uh, brethren from Laos that have their language and, and Laotian brothers and sisters who have their services in Lao. And occasionally we'll have, we've got a bilingual service coming up here in two or three weeks. So we're Spanish speaking brothers and sisters come over. We've had trilingual services where our Laotian brothers have joined us and it gets a little uh, clumsy and a little cumbersome sometime to translate into that many languages. But we know that we're all working out of the same book. That they have Bibles in their native tongue. We have our English Bibles, and, and we're able to, to worship together and, and uh, literally and figuratively be on the same page because the Bibles have been translated, God's Word has been translated uh, into our languages. And so there are other good reasons, but these are just three reasons why Bible has been written down, recorded for us. Now, again, Tim, for Timothy, Scripture was the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, over 3,000 times, it claims to speak with authority. And so you see these phrases like, thus saith the Lord, or the word of God says, the word of the Lord says. And so in the New Testament, you find uh, over 300 direct quotations from the Old Testament, many other allusions to the Old Testament. So for them, for those living in New Testament times, the Old Testament was authoritative. It was important. And sometimes people wonder, well, why do you preach out of the Old Testament? And we spent, uh, I spent three or four months this year preaching from Isaiah. And some people want to know, well, why do you spend so much time in, in the Old Testament? We, we're New Covenant people. We call ourselves a New Testament church. Well, it's because for people in the New Testament, this was their Bible. This was authoritative. They believed that it had come directly from God. It spoke to them. It was inspired by God. And the Old Testament complements and anticipates the New. I like this saying that the New Testament is in the Old Testament contained, the old is in the new explained. The new is in the old contained, the old is in the new explained. And so the Old Testament and the New Testament, they, they complement each other, they, they fit together like two pieces of jigsaw puzzle. Occasionally my wife and I like to do jigsaw puzzles, sometimes around Christmas time. Recently did a thousand piece puzzle of, of Razorback Stadium. And so we like, and it's so gratifying when the pieces, when you find that piece that you've been searching for and it just fits, especially when you put that last piece in there and, and it fits together. And so Old Testament, New Testament fit together like puzzle pieces. And you notice verse 16 says, all scripture is given. All scripture is given. Do you realize that, that first century believers were already, during the first century, we're already starting to consider words that were written by the apostles to be scripture, to be scripture. Now, we know that Paul quotes Moses, he quotes Isaiah, he quotes other Old Testament writers, 
But Paul actually refers to something that's written in the Gospel of Luke and refers to it as Scripture. Here's, here's the example. Uh, it says, For Scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out grain, and the worker deserves its wages. And so when Paul says, Scripture says, okay, so he says, Scripture says, and we know Paul's about to quote Scripture. What's he going to quote from? Probably something from the Old Testament, right? And sure enough, this first part, uh, where it says, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out grain, that comes from the book of Deuteronomy. No surprise there. But that second part, the worker deserves its wages, that's in the Gospel of Luke. Those were Jesus' words, but Luke records them. And so Paul is putting that writing on par with, with Scripture. Here's another example, better known example. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Paul also wrote you with the wisdom God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort. And notice this last part, as they do with other scriptures. And so Peter, a contemporary of Paul, is talking about letters that Paul has written. And what does he call those letters? Scripture, that's scripture, that's inspired by God. And so already in the first century, they were regarding some of these apostolic writings as being scripture. Same level, same par with with the Old Testament uh, writings. Um, And so we teach the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, Someone said it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. I I, I agree with that. Uh, We we teach Old Testament and, and New Testament. The Bible teaches us the complete story of God from uh, redemption, the story of redemption, it goes from creation to new creation, and just kind of a, a, an advertisement for our sessions tomorrow and, and the next day, uh, the next two days, and really the heart of, of this series, we're going to talk about the meta, what people, some people call it the meta narrative of the scriptures, it really just means the, the big overarching story of the Bible. And so we know we've got a lot of Bible stories, but all those stories come together and comprise one large overarching story. It's important for us to know what that story is, and that's what we're going to be uh, talking about uh, the next two days. And so if you pick up your Bible and you just start reading in Matthew, you're missing out on half the story. Actually, you're missing out on about three-fourths of the story because most of what we have in the Bible is, is Old Testament. And so that's, that's the designation in 2 Peter chapter 3. The, the Bible is Scripture. It's graphe. I also want to talk about its inspiration. So the Bible is, and the way that the NIV, I preach out of the New International Version, the way that it says this is that it's God-breathed. It's God-breathed. And uh, I preach from the NIV. I realize that the New International Version isn't almost always the most literal word-for-word translation, but actually on this occasion it is. That's literally what it means, that it's, it's been breathed out from God. This is the breathing out of God through men. Now, sometimes when we tell people this, we say, we believe the Bible's inspired, they might push back a little bit, and they might say, well, I agree that the Bible is inspiring. It's inspiring. And that's as far as some people are willing to go. But is that what we mean when we say that the Bible is inspired? There are a lot of things that I find inspiring. Uh, When I was growing up, I loved the Rocky movies. I found those very inspiring. I, I didn't box, but I played sports. And so before I played whatever sport it was going to be, I would watch one of the Rocky movies to kind of get me pumped up because I found inspiration there. I was inspired by it. Uh, Art can be inspiring. Now, uh, I'm not an art aficionado. I mean, if I see some famous work of art, I'm, you know, I'm usually like, you know, it's not dog shooting pool, but it's all right. Uh, So that's kind of my level of art appreciation. But there are some times we have a world-class art uh, museum in northwest Arkansas, Crystal Bridges, and I could go to Crystal Bridges and I could look at some work of art and I could be inspired by it. I could find inspiration in that. I've heard uh, high school and college uh, commencement addresses that I found to be very inspirational. But is that all we're saying when we say the Bible is inspired? Well, there are some that are only willing to concede that the Bible is inspiring. It's like a Rembrandt painting. It's like a work of Shakespeare. And they would say, well, we believe the Bible was written by smart, educated, articulate men, which is kind of funny to hear that because if they really knew the people who wrote the Bible, they wouldn't say that because these were shepherds and fishermen and fruit pickers and, and uh, I mean, hard blue-collar workers. I mean, hard workers, but they, these weren't academics. These weren't people that were around books all the time. And yet God works through them through this mysterious process of, 
of inspiration and uses them in this very mysterious way. And there are all sorts of theological debates, and, and we hear terms like verbal inspiration, plenary inspiration, inerrancy, and uh, I'm not going to get down in the weeds with all those terms, other than to say, that, I'll leave that to people smarter than me, other than to say this, words are important. Words are important. And so God said to some of the prophets, he said, I have put my words in your mouth. So when they spoke, they were speaking the very words of God. And Jesus said this, Jesus said, truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And so Jesus said, not only are words important, but every character is important. Every stroke of the pen is important. Uh, I, I heard the story about a man who was in a, a business meeting, and he got a text from his wife, and she was out shopping, and she had found a bracelet that she really liked, and the bracelet cost $75,000. And she, she wanted to know if she could buy it. And so he's in this business meeting, but he knows he's got to respond to this. And so he immediately texts back, no, price too high. And she reads that text, and she reads, no price too high. (laughs) What a loving, generous husband I have. Buys the bracelet. So so words are important, and the way that we use words is important, because we want those words to be understood. However, I, I don't think we want to conclude that this is some kind of mechanical inspiration where and, and maybe we picture it this way sometimes, that the, the biblical writers just went into a trance and they just, you know, they just wrote, the Holy Spirit whispered in their ear and they just wrote things down. Uh, there's a, you know, that they, you know, almost like a secretary or a, a stenographer or a copyist. Uh, this is a famous painting from Caravaggio. Again, I'm not an art person, but uh, this is entitled The Inspiration of St. Matthew. And this is probably the way often we, we picture this hangs in a church in, in Rome and, and here's an angel that's descending that's kind of whispering in Matthew's ear as he pens his, his gospel. But what's interesting is that the reason I say that inspiration is not this kind of mechanical inspiration where the writers just completely lose themselves is, is simply because the, the personality and the styles of New Testament writers still come through in their writings. Uh, Matthew was a Levite. And so you would expect there to be a lot of Old Testament quotations in Matthew. Guess what? They're there. Uh, Luke was a doctor. And so you would expect Luke to use some medical terminology in Luke and in Acts. And and guess what? He does. You could find that there. Uh, Paul was a a rabbi schooled in in secular thought and religious thought. And so you would expect Paul to use a lot of different sources in his writing. And he does. And so somehow in this mysterious process of inspiration, these These writers didn't lose their personalities. They didn't lose their styles. They still have their unique uh, styles. And again, this is a mystery. We don't completely understand it. Uh, but, But when you think about it, it's very consistent with the way that God likes to work. Because even think about the incarnation. You know, what does it mean that Jesus was both human and divine? And we know that's true. We accept that by by faith, but it's still kind of mysterious to us. Uh, look at another important passage with me. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. How much time have I got left? How am I doing on time? Doing, doing okay? Okay. 2 Timothy, or I'm sorry, 2 Peter. Second, did I say 2 Timothy? 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so it says, inspiration didn't originate in the minds of religious men. So this isn't just a question of really spiritual religious men sitting around thinking spiritual thoughts and then thinking to themselves, you know, I'm going to write something. This is going to be really good. And that, when you think about it, that's no different than some of the Christian authors that, that we read. I, I like to read you N.T. Know, Wright, Francis Chan, Tim Keller, some of those guys. I, I get some good information, some nut, good nuggets from them, but those aren't inspired. Those aren't divinely inspired writings. This is something very different than that. 
And these men that Peter described, they were moved by God. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that, in fact, that phrase carried along in verse 21. That's a, a maritime metaphor. It's a shipgoing metaphor. And so it was a word that was used of a ship hoisting its sails so that the wind could carry it to a particular destination. That's how inspiration works. That it's, it's these men with their own unique personalities and their own unique styles, but they hoist their sails so the Holy Spirit takes them to the destination that God is leading so that what they write is exactly the message that God wants to communicate. And God is speaking through them. And so from 2 Timothy chapter 3, we've talked about the, the designation, we've talked about uh, the inspiration, and talk a little bit about the application. Not going to spend too much time on this one because this will be the focus of, of the message uh, Thursday morning before we, we break camp. Um, but look once more at 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so what will the word of God do for you? Well, a number of things. It'll teach you things. It's useful for teaching. Uh, Some of you are just insatiable learners. You just like to learn things. The Bible will do that. It will rebuke and correct you. It's useful for that too. Uh, Sometimes we need to be slapped upside the head. Sometimes we need a kick in the behind. The scripture will do that too. It'll speak to us, won't it? And it will convict us and it will strengthen and fortify us. It's it's useful for training in righteousness. I I know some of you, uh, perhaps you like to to work out, you like to exercise. And I I enjoy it. I'm not crazy about it, but I I, I try to, to work that into my schedule. But a lot of us, when we work out, we would say, I can feel myself getting stronger. I can feel my endurance increasing. And that's really good. I want to to do more of that. I want to be more like that. Well, 1 Timothy chapter chapter 4, verse 8 says, Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And so the Bible trains us in, in righteousness and godliness. I remember this verse was painted on the inside of Rhodes Field House at Harding University when I was a student there. So that's where uh, I played a lot of pickup basketball games in that gym. Now they use it for their, their actually their uh, men's and women's teams play in the, it's been redone, play in the Rhodes Field House. But I remember this verse being painted on the wall. What a good reminder it was that, hey, what we're doing, it's good for us to exercise. It's good for us to play some ball and stretch our legs and, and uh, get our lungs working. But it's not nearly as valuable as the instruction that we get from Scripture and the training that we get uh, from God's Word. And so the Bible does a lot of different things. It's amazing in that way. There's no other book like it. And I love this quote. Some books will give you information. Others provide recreation. Many will give you inspiration. It's talking there about natural inspiration that we talked about before. But only one book will give you transformation. And that's the Bible. And so sometimes it comforts, sometimes it convicts, sometimes it confronts. Sometimes we go through in periods of intense grief. And we say, people say, I I received so much comfort from the scriptures. It just gave me so much peace when I was going through this difficult time. And then other times people will say, man, this, this verse really beat me up. It really hit me where I lived. You know, God really spoke to me. He really got my attention with this one. It was tough medicine. But the Bible will convict and confront us also. But perhaps the most important thing the Bible does and, uh, is not in verse 16, but it's in the preceding verse. And so look one more time here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, now verse 15. And from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And so the Bible lets us know we're in trouble. And that we need salvation. We need a savior. So it lets us know we're in trouble, but it doesn't just leave us there. It points us to Jesus, the one who's the hero of this story. Uh, I recently heard of a man who had two advanced degrees. He was a doctor and a lawyer, very smart man. But he was an atheist, raised his children as atheists. Religion was taboo in his family. And he decided that he was going to, to read Jesus' words. Kind of like Chris was talking about this morning. That's, that was his approach, too, at the beginning. He said, I'm just going to read the red-letter words. I'm going to see what Jesus has to say. But just reading that was enough to let him know that, that he was in trouble. That's the conclusion that he came to. I'm in trouble. 
And he did what any smart, educated man would do at that point. He gave his life to Christ. He was baptized into Christ. Scriptures made him wise to salvation because they introduced him to Jesus, who is the hero, who's at the center of the story. And that's not just the story of one man. That's the story of, of many people. I know that's our story. I, by the way, I love hearing the, the testimonies this week. And, and uh, let me, this is just, this isn't in the notes. But people, sometimes we don't like the word testimony, personal story, whatever you want to call it. What, why do we do that? Well, we're spending this whole week talking about Scripture and how Scripture talks, speaks to us, which it does. But if we don't hear stories like we did this morning or like we're hearing this week, then that leaves the impression that everything God did, he did back here in the past, that he's not doing anything today. The power of testimony and personal stories is to remind us God is still active. God is still working. He worked back here. He's still working today. He's still doing things, still touching and and changing lives. But we have these ancient words, inspired by God, useful for so many things, available to us. It's not just another book. It's more than just an important book. It's the book. And it teaches and it nurtures, nurtures us, shapes our worldview. And we don't just read it, we feast on it. And so tomorrow we're going to talk about kind of the big picture of Scripture. I appreciate, again, uh, the opportunity to be with you this week. God bless.